Hello, and welcome to the INET webinar, Hello. The AI Awakening, Implications for the Economy, with Eric Brynjolfsson. I am Pia Malani, Senior Economist here at INET and Director of INET's Innovation Center in San Francisco. Uh, when I moved to Silicon Valley to start the center a few years ago, I was very curious to hear the focus on AGI, or Artificial General Intelligence, which at the time seemed like a science fiction concept to me. While we're still a long ways from um, the reality of AGI, the impact of technology on our world has clearly been accelerated dramatically in the wake of the crisis. Um, and the focus on technology on jobs has clearly been an issue that we need to be uh, concerned about more and more. Um, the US lost about 5.6 million manufacturing jobs between 2000 and 2010. And there's been much discussion about the impact of globalization on the manufacturing center, uh, sector. But according to a study by the Center for Business and Economic Research at Ball State University, 85% of the job losses are actually attribut attributable to technological change, largely automation. A recent report from McKinsey suggests that up to 800 million jobs could be lost to automation by 2030. These were estimates from before the pandemic, which of course has exacerbated this trend quite dramatically. Eric has been working on these issues for many years now and brings us uh, the perspective of someone who deeply understands the world of technology and the economic context within which it functions. His research examines the effects of information technologies on business strategy, productivity and performance, digital commerce and intangible assets. He is the director of the newly started uh, Digital Economy Lab at Stanford and professor of economics and business at Stanford. He's a research, uh, research associate at the NBER and the author of several books, including with co-author Andrew McAfee, the New York Times bestseller, The Second Machine Age, Work, Progress and Prosperity in a Time of Brilliant Technologies. Before I turn over to Eric, INET's president, Rob Johnson, would like to say a few words. And then after the presentation, we'll open it up for Q&A. Uh, you have a button at the bottom of your screen. So if you can type in your questions, we'll get to as many of them as we can. So let me now turn it over to Rob. Thank you, Pia. Well, Eric, I am absolutely delighted that you're here with us today. I just kind of danced through the memories of our interactions over the years seeing you at MIT or meeting with you and Bill Janeway around the second machine age, running into you at the China Development Forum in the hallways and everywhere I go and every time I read something you write or everywhere I go and run into you, every time I read something you write, I see you pulling things together. And when the economics is like a narrow arrow you just, you have this mosaic that you've created for all of us to share in seeing related to the structure of society, the structure of politics driven by technology and at times involving what you might call the philosophical systems clash between East and West over which these technological issues are often brought to a point of tension and pain. So, I, like I said at the, at the outset, I'm delighted that you're here. You illuminate things wherever you sit, whether it's my alma mater, MIT, or your new home in Stanford. And as Pia's in Northern California, I come out there to my home in Bolinas, good portions of the year. So, but wherever you are, I will stay tuned, which means for the next hour, I'll be grinning. Thank you. Well, thank you so much, Rob, and thank you, Pia. Those are very kind introductions. I'll, I'll do my best to live up to them. And I want to say, uh, likewise, I've been so impressed with what you all are doing at INET, and I feel very privileged to have a chance to share a little bit of our research with you all. And I'm especially looking forward to the uh, discussion and the Q&A afterwards. So uh, anybody out there listening, please uh, uh, let me know what questions you have, what comments, and, and, and anything that we touch on or, or you'd like to discuss more, I'm very happy to discuss it. That's uh, one of the most fun parts. Let me just now um, see if I can share 
my slides, which I should be able to, so you can see. And let me just confirm. So you can see now my title slide? Yeah. Great. Um, okay, so what I'm gonna talk about today, as Pia mentioned, is this idea of the AI awakening and what it means for the economy. Um, there have been some just breathtaking improvements in the power of machine learning in particular, but AI more broadly or digital technologies even more broadly. And uh, certainly that's accelerated a lot in the past uh, few months as COVID has forced us all to change the way we're working, including this seminar here right here, doing it on, on Zoom. And a lot of my work, uh, millions of people around the country and around the world have had their lives transformed. And it's part of a, a much broader fundamental change in the economy triggered by these new technologies and, and new ways of doing work. And there's a saying that I think captures some of this. Uh, there are decades where nothing happens and there are weeks where decades happen. I think the, the past few weeks, the past few months have been an example of that. In the past 10 weeks, we've probably had at least 10 years of change in, in areas like remote work. I'll show you some of the data on that as well as in, in other areas of automation. Let me first though, talk about um, automation and how the technology um, has been used more and more. You know, one of the ways to have people work safely and get work done safely is to use more of these technologies. And one example is TensorFlow, which is probably the most popular tool for doing machine learning. Now over 100 million downloads. My team has all downloaded and we use it quite extensively and so are a lot of other people. And, uh, and every month uh, it's breaking new records in terms of people trying to uh, find ways of using machine learning in their work. And it, uh, uh, we are now crossing a really important threshold. Um, if you look at the use of machine learning for many, many tasks, here's one example, um, image recognition. And a decade ago, um, machines really could not recognize objects very well the way humans could. But then Fei Fei Li at Stanford put together uh, ImageNet, 14 million different images. Here are, are four of them, uh, each painstakingly labeled by humans. And then there was a series of contests to see how well the machines could identify what was in them. At first, they weren't that good. You can see by the, the purple line there, but then it accelerated dramatically. Um, the real inflection point was around 2012 when Jeff Hinton introduced deep learning techniques. Before that, they weren't using the deep learning and neural network techniques. You, you've probably all heard about those. Uh, these are very large networks that um, in some ways mimic the way the human brain in, um, processes information. And just recently, well, I say in the past eight years or so, we've had enough computer power and some improvements in the algorithms, and most importantly, massive increases in data availability, digital data availability, and those three things put together have allowed us to use neural nets much, much more effectively to the point now in many applications, including ImageNet, they now surpass humans. Humans are not perfect at ImageNet um, and, and machines can now recognize say dog, breeds of dog or other objects more successfully than the typical person can. But it's not just image recognition. Uh, it's also speech recognition. You know, most of us have, uh, uh, a phone like, uh, like this, an uh, uh, iPhone or, or something else that, and, and, and we have played with it, you know, whether it's Siri or Alexa or, or Google now. I think it's far from perfect, but we're beginning to be in this, I'd say, 10 year period where we went from not being able to speak to our machines to just routinely talking to them and expecting them to talk back to us and answer questions for us. And that's getting a lot better too. I'd say it's not quite a human level in most applications, but it's getting very close. And uh, with Andrew McAfee, we wrote an article in Harvard Business Review. We just reviewed all the different areas where we are getting um, machines to do things that once only humans could do, whether it's in voice recording or analyzing market data or analyzing drug chemical properties, uh, new recipes, analyzing purchases, um, of course, recognizing faces. Um, on the left, there is an example of uh, radiology. Um, where they, and, and, and histology, where uh, they're looking at medical images and recognizing uh, cancer versus not cancer. And it seems like hardly a, a week goes by when I don't see a new article in, in Nature or Science um, describing how a new machine learning system has outperformed humans in a task 
similar to that. So right now we're having a bit of a gold rush going on. Um, hundreds of billions of dollars are going into venture capital and by uh, large corporations uh, trying to stake out opportunities in using machine learning to solve problems that previously only humans could do. And uh, they're making bets that, that this is going to pay off in a big way. And I think, you know, certainly not all the bets are going to pay off, but I think on average, we're, we're, I'm pretty optimistic that we'll have more and more breakthroughs like the ones we've already seen. Uh, one small example that we looked at was just uh, machine translation. We saw an immediate impact. So here's a paper we published last year um, on machine translation at eBay. Uh, they introduced a new system for machine translation and had immediate results. Uh, they did it in several language pairs between English and Spanish, English and French, English and Italian, English and Russian. And in each case, it was a, a natural experiment. We could see how transactions changed before and after machine translation. Here's the example for Spanish in Latin America. And as you can see, um, there was a, a, a very noticeable improvement in sales, about 11 or 12% increase in sales once they switched on the system and people were able to read uh, listings on eBay in, in English um, or in Spanish, whichever was their native language. So this is one of the cases where you could see a, a, a very measurable economic effect. But um, as, uh, as Peter and Rob were mentioning in the introduction, there's a, a lot of concern that while there are a lot of wealth can be created, there's also concern about the distribution of that wealth and, and jobs being destroyed. This is an age old concern going back to, uh, to the Luddites uh, almost exactly 200 years ago. Um, as you, I think you all know, they were smashing the looms because they saw them as eliminating a lot of jobs for skilled artisans. And they were actually right. A lot of jobs were eliminated by this technology. Overall, more wealth was created, but, but as we'll talk about later, there's, there's no economic law that says that everyone's going to benefit. It's possible for some people uh, to be hurt, even as others benefit. And we're going through a transition like that right now. We, I, I think it's going to be even bigger, already is becoming even bigger than what we saw in the Industrial Revolution. And today, it's what Andrew McAfee and I call the second machine age, where what's being augmented and automated isn't just physical muscle power, but um, brains and mental um, work as well. And that's a much broader scope of, of set of tasks. Now, the most natural way to think about how technology is affecting wages is to, is to look at substitution. Um, it's the first thing I think of, I think most people, is a machine doing what a human used to do. Um, but there are many other ways that machines are also affecting work. In addition to substitution, there are also complementarities. Complementarities mean that the machine is making the human work more valuable, not less valuable. Now, which of these is more important? Well, if you look at the data, actually for most of the past 200 years, the complementarities have been the more important factor. And the reason I say that is it, just take a look at what's happened to the wages of a, of a typical person working in the economy. Wages have gone up tremendously over the past 200 years since the time of the Luddites. Although in the last 20 years or so, um, that improvement has stopped and even reversed and wage growth has, has ceased. So we may be moving from technology mostly being a complement to increasingly being a substitute. There are four other factors, demand elasticity, income elasticity, supply elasticity, and the invention of new tasks that also affect how technology is going to affect wages. And Tom Mitchell and I discussed them in more detail in this article called Why, What Can Machines Learn in Science? And we worked through some of the economics of that and, and some of the types of technologies that are affecting each of those. I won't go into them in depth right now, although I guess I'm, I'm happy to discuss them during the Q&A part if you'd like to dive into any of them in more depth. Um, they're all important. And I think uh, the main lesson I want to just leave is we shouldn't just only think about substitution. Technology can and should be used to complement and help people. Um, what I said in my TED talk was we should learn how to race with the machines, helping, having them help us get our work done rather than racing against the machines where we see it as an either or. Um, Pia mentioned that we're far from artificial general, general intelligence, AGI. AGI is this idea that machines can do the full uh, breadth and depth of what humans do. Um, the kind of thing you might see in a Hollywood movie like The Terminator that can just is, is essentially human-like. 
Um, maybe someday we will get to that. I suspect we probably will, but it could be 100 years from now or at least 50 years, I think most uh, machine learning experts think. Right now, we have very powerful AI, and I gave you some examples for vision and voice recognition and other areas, but they're still pretty narrow. They're not general. Um, and that raises a question, at least it did for Tom Mitchell and I, of what are the tasks that machine learning can do well and what are the tasks that it does not do well? And if we could kind of come up with a, a rubric or a way of classifying which tasks are in each of those categories, we'd be better able to understand how the economy is changing. So we went ahead and we consulted with a lot of machine learning experts. And over a period of time, we developed what we call this machine learning rubric. And we applied it to the tasks that are in ONET, not to be confused with INET. Um, ONET, as you may know, is the, uh, an occupational database that has about 18,000 occupation specific tasks, um, about 20 or 30 for each of 950 specific occupations. So for instance, bus driver, economist, primary school teacher, uh, radiologist, they're all in ONET and um, each of them, ha there's a description of what tasks a person has to do in those. And so what we did, um, just to explain the methodology, we took our rubric and we applied it to each of the tasks and we scored it as to whether or not machine learning was suitable, was likely to be able to do that. So there are some things that machine learning can do very well, things that are data intensive and well described, other things that machine learning can't do as well. And uh, so we scored every single task on a five point scale. Actually, we had 10 different people score them, so we had some reliability um, and confidence in our answers that way. And uh, to give you a little better feel, here's the example for radiology. I think everybody, uh, the machine learning folks love to talk about radiologists as, as having their jobs threatened, and uh, with good reason, and that's because some of the most important things radiologists do are interpreting images using computer-aided detection and diagnosis systems. And this is something, as I showed earlier, machines can now do as well, or actually according to the data, better than most radiologists in, in many areas. And so that part of the job, uh, using computers to recognize images has been done very well. But there are other tasks that radiologists also do. In some cases, they are called upon to uh, administer sedation. And that's not something you would want a, a machine to be doing for, for obvious reasons. And of the 27 tasks, we found that um, you know, less than half of them were suitable for machine learning and uh, many other ones, even in radiology, uh, were really best still left to humans. And this was a pattern we saw for every single occupation. Uh, let me be clear, although we looked at all the 950 occupations and we did not find a single one where machine learning ran the table and was able to do everything. In each case, there was still scope for humans having to do some things. And, and as a result, I think it's important to understand that while machines are going to have tremendous effect on the workforce, um, I don't think we're going to see massive end of work or unemployment. It's really more of a restructuring as parts of tasks get done by machines and reallocated. And it's, it's going to be very disruptive. It already is very disruptive. But we're not yet at the stage where machines can do most of the things that humans can do or uh, run the, the full scope of a typical occupation. Um, overall, it is about $713 billion if you look at the, the tasks that are most suitable for machine learning. So it's a very large chunk of the economy. We've barely scratched the surface. Uh, and I think that uh, over the next just three to five years, we'll see huge uh, investments uh, to harvest some of that uh, value that's on the table and capture it by uh, people who are uh, investing in, in machine learning systems. Um, and it, varies a bit across industries. Here's a chart we did of the different industries. You can see uh, retail trade, transportation, food services. Those are some of the industries that have the most tasks that are suitable for machine learning. Just to be clear, what we did here is we took the individual tasks and we aggregated them up to industry. Um, and you can see that different industries have different um, vulnerabilities. You can also group them based on how similar occupations are. So for instance, clerical workers, um, they're in yellow in the middle. Uh, they all cluster together in terms of having overlapping tasks. And it doesn't matter whether it's a clerical worker in manufacturing or in retailing or in uh, uh, medicine, healthcare. Um, we find that they do very similar kinds of tasks, as you can imagine. And um, they are all fairly vulnerable, as are factory workers. Uh, there are other things that are, are less vulnerable. Um, artists and media are less vulnerable. 
um, some of the professional workers, scientists, uh, clergy are less vulnerable. Um, and we can group it by occupations. And, and although, as I mentioned, there's no occupation that is fully automatable, we do see some clear patterns in the data. Uh, on the horizontal axis here is the wage percentile. Um, the ones on the right are the higher paid jobs and the ones on the left are the lower paid jobs. And the vertical axis is how many of the tasks are suitable for machine learning. We did this on a weighted average basis. So some tasks are more important than others. And on the left, you can see, well, you see a downward slope first off. What that means is that you know, there are jobs like cashiers where a lot of the tasks are increasingly automatable. So if any of you have been, you know, checking out from a CVS or a supermarket, you know that it can not only recognize the barcodes, but now um, at least at our, my supermarket can recognize, you know, an onion and an orange and a lemon um, and, uh, and classify them as well. So it's, it's learning more and more of the tasks that humans used to do. But there are some very high paid jobs like airline pilot that also have a lot of tasks that are suitable for machine learning. And uh, uh, we're seeing that happening as well. I couldn't help peeking at where economists were. So economists are down there um, towards the higher end of the pay scale, it looks like, um, and sort of some tasks suitable for machine learning, but, but not as many as some of the other occupations. And we can do this for each of the 950 occupations. Each of those red dots is a different occupation and that's written up in our paper in the uh, American Economic Association papers and proceedings uh, last year. Um, we can also do it by country. So my team has developed a, um, a, a taxonomy for the different countries. Not every country uses uh, ONET and the BLS classifications, but we have a mapping for uh, many of the countries and that allowed us to basically zoom in on particular occupations. I mean, you zoom in on physicians and surgeons and radiologists, like I was mentioning earlier, but all these other ones you can also zoom in on. The size of the box there represents how many people are in that occupation. Um, and um, you can also do it by geography. I presented this in, at Congress uh, last year and uh, they were uh, very interested in knowing which regions were more affected. And you can see it's very uneven. And that's because um, people in America do different jobs in different regions. The people in Manhattan or in Miami Beach do different work than they do in, in Wichita or Cheyenne. Uh, Wyoming looks like it has a lot of vulnerable folks. Uh, Senator Mike Enzi was at the meeting and was very uh, interested to see that. Um, and you can also uh, aggregate it by company. So this is uh, zooming in on uh, a big retailing company, Walmart. And um, I guess I'll just show you the, the chart on the right in particular, the red dot is where it is in terms of the vertical axis is how many tasks are suitable for machine learning. So Walmart has a lot of tasks compared to the rest of the economy that could be done by machines and will likely be automated in the coming years. It's also a little bit to the right on the AI skills index um, compared to other firms. What that means is they actually have a lot of folks on their, in their company that have some of the skills that work with TensorFlow to do this work. So on one hand, they have a lot of vulnerability. On the other hand, they have a lot of capability to carry out those. And we can do this for every, every company by aggregating it up this way. Um, you can see how the vulnerability has changed for different companies over time. This is a large um, financial services company. And uh, over time, more and more of their tasks have been suitable for machine learning. Let me zoom in a little bit on, on what we can do with this. So for instance, um, on the left is the different roles and the bigger the red bar is, the more of the tasks are suitable for machine learning. Towards the bottom there, you see uh, teller, executive assistant, personal banker. Um, and it classifies which of the tasks are more suitable versus less suitable. Let's zoom in on personal banker. Um, in the upper left corner there, you see that personal banker could transition into a number of new things. So while personal bankers have a lot of their tasks that are suitable for machine learning, one option is to reinvent the job and call it personal banker 2.0. Um, in the upper right quadrant, you see that um, they could maybe do uh, more leadership and customer relationship management and less credit authorization and data entry. And that would make them uh, more, um, make their job more robust as automation affects some of the other tasks. Another option is for them to learn new roles and transition to 
in the bottom left, you see they could transition into being a business analyst, a mortgage loan officer, HR manager. Uh, these are things that are areas that are growing as opposed to personal banker. And uh, many of the personal bankers have the skills, according to the skill cap analysis on the right, that would allow them to be successful in those roles. So this is the kind of analysis we do in, in, a, in a startup I'm helping with called um, Second Machine Age Technologies that um, analyzes how we can, uh, how companies can adapt to automation over time. Um, and with just a lot of other analyses we can do with these data. Um, and let me now um, switch talking a little bit about remote work and, and then some of the productivity effects and then we'll open up for questions. Um, there's a lot of concern about how remote work is affecting the economy and the Wall Street Journal, New York Times, a lot of other um, media have written about it, focusing on some of the research that we've been doing the past uh, couple of months. Um, here's one of the papers that uh, we dove in a little bit. Uh, I just got an announcement this morning that it's going to be presented at the American Economic Association uh, in, in January. And uh, what we did is we looked at uh, about 75,000 people, um, you did a survey of 75,000 people and asked them about their use, whether they were working at home or working in the office, what professions they were in, where they were, what um, occupations. And from this, we were able to get a, a snapshot of what was going on with the shift to remote work. And what we found, well, I'll just give you a few highlights here. Uh, what we found was that uh, over a third of uh, Americans have switched to working at home, including me and maybe many of you. Uh, even before COVID, uh, about 15% of Americans had been working at home. So if you put those two numbers together, it adds up to about 50% of Americans uh, are working at home currently. And that's a huge, huge transition, of course, and it has all sorts of effects on real estate, uh, wages, globalization, other factors. And we're, we're looking at them a little bit more closely now. I'm happy to discuss them later. Um, it's been uneven across the country. Uh, we found that, uh, as you might expect, um, there are a couple of things that predicted people working at home. One was the incidence of COVID. When COVID hits a state harder, it uh, tend to have more people who shift to working at home, as you might expect. Um, also, the share of information workers. So if you look at professionals and managers, other people who would work mostly with data, knowledge, and information, they are more likely to switch to working at home, whereas people who work in manufacturing or assembly or construction, uh, not surprisingly, they don't have the opportunities to work at home. And unfortunately, instead, they're more likely to become unemployed or furloughed. So uh, it, it has very uneven effects depending on the kinds of work people are doing and therefore the kinds of states that are affected. Um, and we've also used these tools to understand the workforce better. So this is a new paper um, that we're just releasing uh, probably next week um, called Job to VEC. And what it does is it takes all the job postings and it converts them into vectors that we can analyze, uh, mathematical vectors. We looked at over 200 million online job postings from Burning Glass Technologies. And then we trained a system, um, these huge neural net systems. We used one of these language models with over 100 million parameters. And this allowed it to understand in some sense um, what, the, what the jobs were and how they were related to each other. And we could then do some mathematical analyses on them. For instance, we could say, suppose you took a software engineer and you added some skills to the job posting and you gave them skills. And I mentioned TensorFlow earlier or Python or other machine learning skills. What would that do to that person's, that job's prospects? And what we found was that the classifier would reclassify them from software engineer into machine learning expert and uh, make a, have a predicted uh, salary that was about $6,000 higher than they were before. So we can do those kinds of manipulations of what, what would happen at least according to the model, um, as you added skills or move people from one geography to another geography or move them through time or do other manipulations. So this, I think, is going to be a very powerful tool going forward to understand the workforce and what the equilibrium wages are and equilibrium demand is uh, using this just massive data set of, uh, of 200 million online job postings. Um, one, of the, one of the things we did with it that was kind of fun was we uh, use the um, natural language tool 
to make predictions about which tasks were most remotable versus less remotable. And you can see here on the left, some of the more remotable um, types of jobs were like sales managers and uh, educators, marketing managers. The ones that were less remotable were people who were assembling things or rigging um, automotive body, uh, truck mechanics. As you can imagine, those did not score very high on remotability. But this gives us a, a way to sort of objectively analyze where uh, remote, uh, remote work is going to most likely to be effective. Um, let me uh, now speak briefly about the productivity boom, and then I'd love to switch into getting Q&A and, and discussions. Um, there hasn't been a productivity boom, and I think that's actually the mystery because these tools, at least in my view, have been quite, quite remarkable, but we're not seeing it show up in the productivity data. Um, in fact, rather than growing, productivity growth has slowed down. It's slowed down for about a decade. Um, in the decade preceding 2004, productivity growth averaged 2.8% per year uh, in the United States. And since then, it's been less than half that much. Uh, last year was another disappointing year of productivity growth, about 1.3%, which is typical for the past decade. And it's not just the US. Virtually every OECD country has had similar size slowdowns. So this is what we call a modern productivity paradox. Um, amazing technologies, but it's not showing up in the productivity data. So what's going on? Let me just lay out briefly four explanations. And this is work I've done with Chad Severson of um, University of Chicago and Daniel Rock uh, was a postdoc with me at MIT and now he's a professor at Wharton. Um, so one possibility is that just people like me and a lot of others have just been um, fooled by the technology and that maybe it's not as amazing as it appears. Another possibility is that we've been mismeasuring things and um, that there are benefits, but they aren't showing up in the productivity data. A third possibility is that um, the benefits are being captured by a very small group, and so we're not seeing broad shared prosperity. And finally, a fourth possibility is that, you know, it's coming, it takes time for the productivity benefits to work their way through the economy. I think there's some evidence for all four of these explanations. Um, but overall, I think the first three are less convincing for the broad story than the fourth one. Um, you know, just to quickly crit critique each of these four explanations, you know, while there are certainly hype about things, at the same time, um, we went through an analysis and found that, that even, even some of the simpler technologies are, are quite transformative. And so it, it it's not, doesn't make sense to say something as fundamental as vision or language understanding or intelligence, artificial intelligence in various domains is, is not an important technology. It's probably at least as important as say electricity. Um, mismeasurement is certainly a problem. And I used to think this was the biggest part of the story uh, because there's no question that we're mismeasuring a lot of the digital revolution. Anything that has a price of zero, like uh, Wikipedia or email or Zoom, um, gets a contribution of precisely zero to the GDP statistics, because GDP only counts things that have a, a positive value. So you might think that we're missing most of the benefit, and I think we are. But the reason that I'm less convinced now that this is the main explanation of the slowdown is that we were also missing a lot of benefits 20 years ago and 50 years ago and 100 years ago. Um, penicillin and radio and TV and, and other innovations in earlier eras were also free uh, or nearly free and also added tremendous to living standards. And now it's less obvious that the share of free goods has grown I think they probably have, but it's, it's just a tougher argument to make than, I, than just saying there are some. Uh, maldistribution is a big part of the story, I, I, especially at INET. I think you guys are very familiar with and have pioneered a lot of the work on showing that work has, uh, sorry, wealth has become much more uneven. The top 1% has gotten a much bigger share. Uh, but when we ran the numbers, that wasn't enough to account for the, the productivity showdown. Slow down. So I'm going to focus more of my attention on the implementation and restructuring lags as the main story. Um, and the idea here is that the technology is amazing, but to really harness it, you have to reinvent work. And we haven't done that. 
We haven't made the complementary inventions, the investments in skills and organizational change, and that as we make those investments, we'll start to harness it. The same thing happened in earlier eras with, well, with electricity, for instance. It took 30 or 40 years to get the full benefits of electricity. So the, the paradox can be resolved by, if you look at the optimist, they are looking at the, today's technologies and imagining what they can do in the future, hopefully the near future. The pessimists are looking at the past and saying, well, we haven't made those changes yet. So they're not actually talking about the same thing and they could both be correct at the same time. Um, if you extrapolate from the past though, you shouldn't assume that past productivity growth is the best predictor of future productivity growth. We did a little exercise where we looked at any given 10 year period of productivity growth on the horizontal axis. And then we looked at how much that predicted 10, the productivity growth in the next 10 years. And as you can see, there's essentially no correlation. So if you had bad productivity in one period, it did not mean you were gonna have bad productivity in the next 10 year period or good productivity, medium productivity. There's basically no correlation. And therefore, I don't think it's a good idea to extrapolate our bad performance in the past 10 years and say that's the way it's going to be. I tried to make this point to the, uh, the Bureau of, sorry, the Congressional Budget Office when I was presenting in Washington. Uh, as you may know, they have lowered all the productivity uh, estimates for the next 10 years on the argument that we haven't done well in the past. And I said, I told them I thought, I thought that was premature and that the better way to understand what's going on in the future is to understand the underlying technologies rather than just uh, assume that the future is going to be the same as the past. Um, so I think I've mentioned electricity a little bit. Um, let me just mention that the core of this argument is that computerization means a lot more than just buying a computer or buying machine learning systems. 90% of the investment is in new skills and new business processes. So when somebody installs, say, a new enterprise resource planning system, we analyze this, um, for every dollar they spend on the software and the hardware, they spend nine or ten dollars on organizational change and training. That additional investment is an intangible asset and it generally does not show up as a capital asset on the company's balance sheet and it generally does not show up as an asset in the national accounts. But to an economist, I think it, it is a real investment. The fact that you can have a, a say a factory that is has new business processes, it allows it to produce output at a greater rate than they did before. Maybe that factory can now produce twice as much output as before. So effectively, you've built a second factory. It's just a factory that's made of business processes and information rather than a factory that's made of bricks and mortar. The bricks and mortar factory counts as an asset. The one that's made of intangibles doesn't officially count as an asset, but you can see that it does have value. Um, the thing is that those investments in intangibles take time and energy and uh, they don't happen instantaneously. So you have this illusion of nothing happening while you're investing in the intangibles and then only later you can harvest it. And it leads to what Chad Severson, Daniel Rock and I call the productivity J curve. It's, a, it's an illusion where during the first five to 10 or more years, you have a dip in measured productivity. During that downward part of the curve, what's going on is that companies are investing in reinventing their business processes and workers are learning new skills. And the economy is going through a transformation. All that investment goes unmeasured and uncounted in our national accounts. So it seems like a lot of churn with no re nothing really to show for it. And then later, you start to harvest it. And once you harvest it, now you get benefits and, and now actually, the whole story is reversed. Now companies are getting benefits seemingly out of thin air. In reality, it's because they made these investments, but since the investments weren't measured, it just appears that they're becoming unusually productive um, with the same amount of bricks and mortar, or same amount of equipment. And the net result is this, is this J curve or it's sort of a J curve where it goes down at first and then it, it rises later. And uh, we've seen this happen, not just um, with artificial intelligence, 
but you go back to the history and Paul David and others have documented exactly this happened with uh, electricity. Um, a number of people have described it happening with, uh, with the steam engine. Uh, in other work, it's been shown to uh, have occurred with internal combustion and other general purpose technologies. So it's a pervasive pattern of uh, disappointment at first, followed by a surge in productivity um, that seemingly came out of nowhere. But I think the real answer is it came out of investments in intangibles. Um, to run the numbers a little bit, and then we'll, we'll go to, to questions. Um, take self-driving cars. Uh, there were over $80 billion worth of investment in self-driving car technology, but there are essentially no uh, self-driving cars you can use in commercial uh, uh, use. The no, no chauffeurs have been laid off, no truck drivers have been laid off. Um, that may well happen, probably will happen in the next five or 10 years. But for now, we're seeing a lot of investment going in and no improvement in output on the other side. Over time, if you, you know, in the paper, we work through the math of this, we expect it to add about 0.11% um, to productivity growth over the next 15 years. And there are over a dozen other applications like this, each of which will add maybe a tenth of a percent. So we could, if, if, the, uh, if these uh, applications come through, we could easily see productivity grow by 1% or more per year, which would be uh, enough to bring it back to the old levels and even surpass the old levels. Let me just finally say that while productivity is very important and it's great to have uh, the economic pie bigger, digital progress is making the economic pie bigger, um, there's no economic law that everyone's going to benefit. Um, it's possible for uh, a majority of the people to be left behind now, that's not what happened for most of the past 200 years since the Industrial Revolution, but unfortunately, it does describe what's happened the past 20 years or so, where we've seen tremendous growth in the economy overall. We have record levels overall of, of productivity and, and, and GDP, uh, setting aside the past couple of months with COVID. And uh, uh, more millionaires, more billionaires than ever in history. But um, median incomes has really stagnated. Here's a chart uh, we call it the great decoupling of that gap that many people have pointed out now. Um, and we wrote about it in our, in our book, Second Machine Age, um, where productivity is hitting new highs, but the typical person or the person at the 50th percentile hasn't seen uh, a significant share of that. How is that possible? Well, it's because most of the gains have gone to the top 1%. It doesn't have to be that way for most of the post-war period, or for that matter, before then, uh, productivity and median income kind of grew in tandem, at times median income even growing faster. But for a number of reasons, and we could talk about it in the, in the discussion, it's become much more unbalanced. And, uh, and one of the things we can do to raise median income would be to, uh, to bring those lines in closer alignment with each other. So let me just uh, conclude by saying that we have powerful technologies already available, not only for machine learning, but also for remote work. Um, and the technologies are here. And one of the reasons I'm, I'm enjoying spending some time in Silicon Valley is I, I'm closer to some of the people who are inventing these technologies and learning a lot about their capabilities. But the second point is, is very important, and that is that simply having the technology is not enough to uh, har harvest these benefits or to increase productivity. Business models need to change, you need new skills. Governments, for that matter, need to update their policies. Now, some of this has accelerated. There's been a, a shock to the system and things like remote work have happened a lot faster than they probably would have had otherwise. Um, but it's still something that is an ongoing process. And ultimately, understanding the nature of those changes um, is going to determine which individuals, which companies, which nations are the winners and which ones are left behind. But um, if you want to have shared prosperity, which I think all of us do, then it's not going to be enough to just uh, sit back and wait for it to unfold. You need conscious policies uh, in terms of government policies, as well as uh, corporate and, and individuals have to think about how they're going to position themselves with the skills to succeed in the, the second machine age in this new economy. So 
there's a lot of research behind what I covered there. I went through a lot of material quickly. You can go to my website and, and download all my papers for free at bernyolson.com. Um, we also have some websites that go into more depth in some of the stuff I did with the company, Second Machine Age Technologies. Or I have a Twitter feed, and I'm happy to uh, have uh, uh, I, I update my, my uh, research there quite frequently as well. So with that, um, why don't we turn it over to uh, Q&A, and I want to thank you for giving me a chance to present the research. I'm happy to have any questions or comments you all may have at this point. Eric, thank you. That was um, so helpful. You covered a huge range of subjects and you did it with data that we uh, don't often get a chance to see. So it was really helpful to see some of the data underlying these questions that we discuss so frequently. Um, before I turn to the questions that have come in, I was thinking a little bit about the four different reasons you laid out for um, the discrepancy between productivity and technology. Right. And it brings to mind some of Carlotta Perez's work where she talks about how we see cycles with respect to technology and how they're incorporated. And one of the points that she makes quite clearly is that it, it really is dependent on what kind of policies and structures we have in place. Uh, it, this doesn't happen automatically. The way it happens really depends on what is the context within which it's happening. Mm -hmm. And you talked a little bit about how we can shift to uh, personalized banking 2.0. Right. And you know the example that's often given when we talk about substitu uh, substitution versus complementarity effects of technology is this issue of ATMs and how there was a concern about how ATMs were going to replace um, bankers and instead bankers just changed what they were doing and we ended up employing many more. Um, but really, once again, what this is going to depend on is the context within which this is happening. And as you point out, we've seen this great decoupling and mm -hmm. we've seen really this issue of ownership of technology. And if we are really going to be shifting towards technologies that are more complementary than uh, substitutive, not quite sure what the word is, but um, won't that depend on the incentive structures that we have built into our economic systems? Is there a way of structuring incentives so that we actually steer technology towards the kinds of technologies that will not substitute for labor, but rather in the direction where we can um, increase labor. For example, if, if I yeah. look at the numbers you presented on self-driving cars, it said that we have this huge increase in productivity once they come online, and that was really a result of them replacing the drivers. So how do we think about this so that we can actually steer technology in a direction that leads us to everyone being able to well, share? Well, I think you've hit, hit the uh, nail on the head exactly. We can change the incentives. And one of the reasons, in my view, that things have gone against workers recently is that there's been a very explicit and perhaps conscious effort to switch the incentives in the opposite way. Right now, we massively subsidize, for instance, automation and capital investment and penalize labor. Um, so if, if, you're, if, you're a, if you're an entrepreneur and you have, you have two scientists come to you with brilliant ideas that each make you a, a billion dollars, one of which will employ lots of people and one of which will employ nobody. And they both lead to a billion dollars to your profit, let's just say they do. Um, which one are you going to pick? Well, right now our tax system heavily, heavily steers you towards the one that doesn't employ people. Because if you employ people, you have to pay taxes, you pay social security, um, there's a whole set of uh, health and other benefits that um, you become responsible for that you wouldn't have been otherwise. If you can um, have um, a, uh, what, what's the word that they use? A, um, you know, if you, can, if you can scale up costlessly without employing more people, uh, scalable, if you can have a scalable uh, process is what they call it, uh, that doesn't involve people, then you can keep all those benefits without having to pay the government as much. The government collects a lot more when you employ people than when you don't. I don't think that's the set of incentives we want. I mean, I think what that does is it, is it tells entrepreneurs, think about ways of avoiding hiring people. That might have been something to do in, in you know, 100 years ago when we were maybe more labor scarce than we are now. I'm not sure it ever was, but certainly right now, I don't think it's the right set of incentives. On top of that, there are issues around training and education. Um, there's a whole set of government policies that you know, 
now are not in place for encouraging complements versus substitutes. I also think it's not just on the government. I mean, you know, it would be great if, if Congress and the administration were more attuned to this. Maybe they will be uh, after the election. Um, but um, it's also something CEOs uh, need to think about and labor leaders and individuals need to think about as they develop their skills. And I, I gave a talk to uh, at the one of the biggest AI conferences, and I told them to think about not focusing so much on making AI that substitutes for humans. There's a a common strategy among AI researchers of trying to replicate humans. You know, they, there's something called the Turing test, which is can you make a machine that can't be distinguished from a human? And often, whether it's a, a hand gripper or something else, they have as the human as the standard that they're trying to replicate. And I told them that that might be a fun intellectual exercise, but it's actually the opposite of what you want to do if you want to create shared prosperity. If you want to create shared prosperity, you should be focusing on making machines do things that humans cannot do and leave the humans to do the things that they can do well. So machines can see, you know, ultraviolet and x-rays. They can do, you know, a thousand things that humans can't do. Work on those capabilities rather than trying to make them more and more similar to humans. If you make them similar to humans, you turn them into substitutes for humans. If you make the robots different, they're more likely to be complements. So I think, you know, again, it's government, industry, individual workers, technologists, they should all be thinking about complements versus substitutes. Thank you. Uh, I'm going to turn to the questions we have here. I have a question from Tom Coyne. Will the burst of technology development driven by COVID's forcing more highly skilled workers to work from home lead to far more global competition for these jobs and downward pressure on employment in high wage locations? That is a, a great point, something I've been thinking about. So Tom, is, I've been thinking along the same ways. So a lot of people are pointing out that, you know, people are working remotely, but the thing is, if you work remotely, you could be 10 miles away or you could be 10,000 miles away. And it probably doesn't make that much of a difference. I'm, I'm, where are you in, are you in New York or California right now? Uh, uh, yeah. uh, I'm not sure we can get a response. Let's see if, oh. oh. Oh, no, no, but, but where, where, where are you, Pia? Oh, me, Pia? I'm in Los Angeles, yes. You're in Los Angeles. So I'm, I'm like three or 4,000 miles away from you right now. Um, but, you know, we're, we're working remotely. But as Tom was saying, um, we are able to have, you know, a, a, an entrepreneur or manager. They don't need to work with just the people who are in their neighborhood anymore. The commuting zone becomes increasingly irrelevant if you're online. And I think there's going to be this interesting paradox that over time we everyone has pointed out that globalization in the world of atoms is under pressure people are reshoring their supply chains there are trade restrictions going up there's less immigration so when it involves physically moving material goods services people we're seeing less globalization but what not enough people are paying attention to is tom's point that I think we'll see more globalization of information work as we people work remotely. And that could put downward pressure on a lot of the people um, who are working in those as well. Downward pressure, maybe some of the people in America, upward pressure if there are people in India or Africa who now have access to a global market that they didn't have before. But it's what economists call factor price equalization. That, um, whatever skills you have, you are now in a global marketplace and, and that could be good or bad depending on how competitive you are uh, in terms of wage and capabilities with, with people in other countries. Thank you. Uh, we have a question here from Edward Haddad. Is there a significant difference in AI advancement in the US versus China or other countries? Yeah, so I've looked at this a fair amount. Um, I'm involved in an organization called the AI Index. I started this with uh, some other folks. It's based at Stanford now, and we map um, progress in a lot of different areas. Um, so you can go to, it's called AIindex.org, and we have a, report, a big report that comes out once a year, but ongoing statistics. And um, what we've seen is certainly that China is making a lot of strides. And there are certain areas, like face recognition, where, where China is ahead of the United States. Um, to oversimplify a little bit, in more of the fundamental categories, um, I think the consensus is the U.S. has better core basic research in many of the applied areas, um, especially ones that lar involve large data sets. China is either catching up rapidly or has surpassed the United States. I was uh, at the 
triple AI, the American, well, actually, that's interesting. The triple AI used to be the main conference. It used to, the, the triple AI used to stand for American Association for Artificial Intelligence. They've renamed it because more people submit papers from China now than the United States. So the new name of it is the something like the Association for the Advancement of Artificial Intelligence. They took American out of the title because it's become a global uh, conference. And uh, more than half of the papers are, or it's not more than half, I should say, more, more, than the, more papers from the United, uh, are from China than the United States. There are also many papers from other countries, of course. Those are the top two. Um, subjectively, talking to a lot of the researchers, they felt like the quality of the papers and the fundamental advances were better from the Americans. So it was sort of a little bit of a quantity versus quantity trade-off and maybe applied versus basic trade-off. But it's um, certainly China is a, is, a, is a huge power in artificial intelligence. I point you to uh, Kai-Fu Lee's work, who I think he's written one of the better books on this, uh, AI Superpowers, where he compares the relative strengths and weaknesses of each, of each uh, nation's AI systems. Uh, I have a question here from Robert Owen. To what extent will machine learning and other related recent digital technologies likely contribute to yet another digital divide between developed countries and other periphery zones? What is the role for national and international policy coordination responding to such, an, uh, to such a challenge? Well, I guess this is in some ways the flip side of Tom Coyne's question. I mean, as we get more globalization, it could be beneficial for the people in developing countries who have access to the internet and have some of the skills. On the other hand, um, many people in those countries don't have either the technology access, although that's becoming more ubiquitous, even just with mobile phones, um, but often they don't have the, the skills um, that uh, are in demand now. And I think there's a real risk that um, some of the rungs of the ladder are being removed that developing countries used to use to climb up the development ladder. It used to be you could you could have low wage manufacturing, and it wasn't didn't require a lot of skilled work. But you know whether it's in textiles or other areas, um, these were places where a uh, worker in, in Vietnam uh, or Taiwan could compete with a worker in Germany or Switzerland, the United States, just on the basis of having lower wages. But now many of those jobs are done by robots, and that makes it you know low wages alone are less attractive. Um, the kinds of tasks that are less likely to be done by machines tend to be ones with more complicated cognitive demands, more creative work, and that often requires more education. And uh, you know, so some countries have successfully or are in the midst of successfully navigating that, like, like Taiwan and, and large parts of China we were just mentioning, but other countries may be caught on the other side of that uh, transition without the same kind of path going forward. So it's certainly possible or even likely that, that a lot of people are going to be left behind unless we, uh, unless we actively uh, try to uh, improve their human capital and the skills that are, that are suitable for the, um, you know, the digital age. Yeah, we have a comment here from Jack Gao uh, referencing something that came up in a previous webinar, which says, uh, we should stop wishing for the ideal workforce, but making, make technology work for the current workforce. Um, well, you know, I don't think it's an either or. Um, certainly, when I talk to the technologists, as I mentioned, I, I encourage them to develop technologies that complement human workers. But we've always invested heavily in reskilling the workforce as well. The reason, well, when I say we, the United States has, you know, became a world leader, both in productivity, but also in equality, because it invested much more in education than other countries. You go back to the 1800s, and primary schools became common in the United States, even when they weren't very common in, in Europe, uh, people thought it was, some people thought it was crazy to have, you know, farm children learning, reading and writing and other skills. Of course, it, that turned out to be a very important investment. Later, there was the high school movement, the college movement. And one of the reasons the United States is not as far ahead or even falling behind now is that it hasn't made those same level of investment in education and training as it used to. But I think it has to be, um, you know, across the board, um, people are constantly going to have to change and upgrade their skills. I, I don't think that, uh, that we reached the end of a time, uh, need for doing that. And technologists should be adapting their technology for them as well. Um, and, and for that matter, you know, other groups, entrepreneurs need to be thinking of how to combine technology and, and people in, in different ways to create value. 
and governments need to create the infrastructure to support it. So it's, uh, it's an across the board, there's no one party that has to, or could do the whole job by themselves. Thank you. Um, with that, we are out of time. So Eric, I would like to thank you again for taking the time to do this with us, despite all the technological glitches that you had to struggle with. Um, we really appreciate it. That was a really interesting um, discussion of a range of issues that we're struggling with um, that have been really exacerbated, I think, by the pandemic or accelerated by the pandemic, I should say. Mm -hmm. And um, we are eager to connect with you uh, with your new center at the Digital Economy Lab at Stanford. Uh, and I would also like to thank everyone who tuned in today. Uh, we will be having our next webinar in two weeks on August 6th, where we will have Kaushik Basu uh, discussing the long run impact of the pandemic on the global economy. So touching um, on India and some of the other developing economies and what the effect uh, has been and will be on those countries. So thanks once again and um, take care everyone. Thank you so much, Pia. It was uh, really a pleasure. I'm glad I had, we had a chance to connect.